Good morning, everybody. I pray that you guys are doing well. We are going to go ahead and hop straight into the word because I believe that the Lord has a word for us today. We are in our series called The Church Has Left the Building. Why? Because we believe that God is trying to get us back to the way that things used to be when he started the church. I believe that God wants to do some things in our life and in the life of the church that will change and impact the world as we know it forever. People say the coronavirus is going to change the world. People say other things are going to change the world. But I'm going to tell you this. There is nothing that can change the world even more than Jesus and the power of his gospel. So, guys, we want to get straight into it. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Acts chapter three, verse one. Let me say that again, Acts chapter three, verse one. And today we are going to deal with Peter and uh, a situation that happened at the beautiful gate. So let's go ahead and pray and then we're gonna get straight into the word, amen? Father God, we just come before you today, Lord, and we just ask that you might bring glory to yourself during this time, that your word would go forth, that it would be your word, not me preaching, but that you would speak through me in such a way that it would impact your people, God. We need the Holy Spirit to fall on us. We need the Holy Spirit to saturate us. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us, to lead us, to guide us, to teach us, and to instruct us in how to go, God. So would you remove all hindrances in us that would keep us from receiving your word, God. We ask right now for a spirit of repentance, Lord God, that there would be nothing in us that would block us from hearing your word, God, and that you would do exceedingly and abundantly above anything we could ask or imagine. God, we ask that we would lay down our priorities, lay down our pride, lay down our agenda and pick up yours, God, because you are the only one worthy of being followed. So God, would you have your way right now? Uh, Glorify yourself. And it's in Jesus name that we pray. Amen. Let's just go ahead to chapter three, verse one, and we're going to read verses one, two through 10 real quick. And it says this. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, uh, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate at the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Today, I briefly want to talk to you guys about the topic of everybody needs a hand sometimes. Everybody needs a hand sometimes. We're in this series called The Church Has Left the Building. And what we're really dealing with is the fact is that the church has lost a lot of impact that it's had in the world. Not because Jesus has lost power, not because God has ceased to be in control, but mainly because I believe that a lot of the people in the church are no longer functioning as Jesus intended for the church to function. We have gotten so caught up in our own agenda, our own jobs, our own lives, our own extracurricular activities, uh, our own desires, that what happens is that we lose our, our passion for the things that Jesus wants us to be passionate about. We lose our focus for the things that Jesus wants us to be focused on. And because of that, we cease to do the work that Jesus has called us to do. And people who don't have people in their lives sharing the gospel, sharing the message of Jesus, giving the life giving, transforming power of Jesus, they they just go about the motions. And many of them are hurting. Many of them are broken. Many of them are in pain. Many of them are mentally crashing, spiritually crashing, financially crashing, families crashing. And for many of us, we sit and act as if we don't care. But Jesus is calling us to get back on his ship, to get back on his agenda, to get back to living lives that he has given us when he purchased us by his very blood. Jesus says, get a biblical life. 
I love that line. Get a biblical life. Uh, the president of Moody Bible Institute when I was there, Dr. Joseph Stoll preached a series called Get a Biblical Life. And just that has stuck with me for so many years because so many of us have a worldly life. So many of us have a life that is caught up and wrapped up in so much other stuff. And the Bible, Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, none of that stuff really seems to be in the forefront of our mind as we go about living our day to day lives. But as we get into this text here in Acts chapter three, we're going to see what it looks like when somebody is walking with Christ, living out their life for Christ. And even in the motions of their day to day life, we see how God can use them to make an impact. And I believe that the same impact he made in, in Peter's life here, uh, he wants to make in your life right now, in your everyday goings. So guys, right here, we go to Acts chapter three, and let's just give a little background to this because one of my actual favorite verses in the book of Acts actually happens right before here in Acts chapter two, verses 42 through 47. This is after Pentecost. This is after the Holy Spirit has fallen fresh on the disciples and they've begun to speak in languages that we know as tongues. And now people have been evangelized. And it says that the number was added to that day. Three thousand people who were saved, three thousand people saved. And now they're beginning to live in community in 42 through 47. They have all things in common. They're doing all kind of stuff together, breaking bread, fellowship, prayers and Signs and wonders are happening through the disciples, the apostles. People are being saved and every day is being added to their number. That's what the Bible says. Every single day that number is growing. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if in the life of the church, every single day people were being added to the kingdom of God? Guess what? The reason that it's not happening is not because God's power has ceased, but because we've ceased doing the work. But when we get to Acts chapter three, right after this, we see people who are in the middle of that lifestyle of living out of the abundance and overflow of the spirit and the, the direction of Jesus. And so we get to Acts chapter three, verse one. And it says this. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the third hour of prayer, the ninth hour at the, at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Now, here's the amazing thing about that. In that Jewish culture and in that time, there were two times per day that they would have these hours of prayer. And they, along with that hour of prayer, they would also have some sacrifices that the priests would do. And so people in that time would go to the temple to participate in those prayers together and also to witness the sacrifice that was happening. And this would happen at certain times. But the second of those per day happened at the ninth hour, which is probably around three o'clock in the afternoon. So it's about three o'clock in the afternoon. We see this and we see Peter and John and they're going up to this temple to participate in these things. They're not doing something extra special. They're going about living that biblical life. Hey, we're dedicated to prayer. We're dedicated to being there for the sacrifice. So let's go up to the temple like it would be our habit and let's go see this. And it says in, in verse two, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. I think in this, ver in this verse two, there's a lot there, guys. There is so much there that we need to unpack because I really think that what we see in this man in verse two is really a, a, a small symbol of everything we see in our world today. Here's the truth. People are broken. Guess what? Everybody may not have been lame since birth in their feet and in their legs, but I believe that everybody from the moment that they're born, they are broken. And so there's three observations that I want to make about the state of people who need a hand in life. Okay. The state of people. The first thing we see in chapter two is that, and a man was lame from birth. Let me say that again. A man was lame from birth. Here's the reality about people in the world, all of us. The Bible says that uh, there is no one righteous, no, not one. David says it like this. I was born in iniquity, which literally means I was born in sin. I was born with issues. I was born with problems. I was born with things in me that don't look like Jesus, that don't reflect Jesus. Jesus and that don't work properly without Jesus. Do you know that, that the people in this world who don't have Jesus have things that don't function in their heart, in their spirit, in their life? Because guess what? There are some things that only Jesus can enable. You know, I was sitting on a, on a, on a video call the other day and I'm on this video call. And so my picture comes up and I'm sitting there talking. And what's happening is this, is that 
I'm talking, but nobody's hearing what I'm saying. I'm talking and I'm moving my mouth. I'm moving my hands. I've got all of the motions, but no one can hear anything that I'm saying. And so I'm trying to do some things to make the volume work, but the volume was not working. Do you not know what the issue was? The issue was this, is that the person who was in charge of the call had set it up so that anybody else who was on the call could not speak unless they unmuted the person themselves. See, even though I had a mute button there and, and it, it would not allow me to speak because the person in charge was the one who had to give the permissions and enable it so that I could talk. Guess what? That is the same thing that happens in the life of many people. There are many people going through the motions of life and they're trying. They're trying to get it together. They're trying to keep their family together. They're trying to keep their children together. They're trying to keep their finances together. They're trying to keep their job. They're trying to be good. But guess what? Good is not God. There are some things in our life that because Jesus is in control, he is the only one that can hit the button and enable us the ability to be free, to go, to do, to have power in what we're doing. That is the reality of what's happening. Guess what? People are born broken. And just like this man, it says this man was lame from birth. His legs literally did not work from the moment that he came out of the womb. He had a deficiency. He had something that made him lesser than in some ways he felt like. He had something that, that left him with an inability to function like everybody else who was deemed whole. Guess what? All of us are born that way. But guess what? The thing is that you don't have to just be born. You don't have to stay that way. All of us may be born that way. You don't have to stay that way. It's up to you. Are you willing to allow Jesus to, to do the work that he needs to do to enable you to function on full capacity? But even more so, do y'all realize that a lot of times when Jesus wants to do something, he doesn't just do it. He does it through people. He wants to see people set free and he wants to do it through you and I. Guess what? Everybody needs a hand sometime and he wants us to be the ones who give the hand. Let's keep going and seeing what else we see besides the fact that this man was born broken. We also see something else in two. It says this. And a lame man from birth was being carried. You know what? This is a one that got me as I began to look at this. This man lived such a lifestyle that he was used to people conforming their life to his brokenness. It says that the people who were around him, they carried him. They didn't strengthen him. They didn't have the ability to strengthen him. They didn't have the ability to change his condition. All they did was carry him back and forth. Guess what? They continue to work around his condition. It's a shame when the people in our world aren't trying to give us the cure. They're not trying to do the things that could be done to help us. But instead, they're like, you know what? We're going to just be with you and we're going to walk with you as you have this deficiency. But guess what? We're not going to try to help you get out of it. All these people in his life did was carry him in his brokenness. You know, I think there's some love. Yeah, we want to be around people. We want to be faithful to people. But here is the reality. We need people around us who are trying to get us closer to Jesus. People who are around us that are trying to give us the life giving power power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which could unlock the things that are broken in us and fix them. But the reality is if you keep yourself around broken people, broken people can't fix you. And guess what? There are people in this world who are only surrounded by broken people. There are people in this world who are only surrounded by people who don't have Jesus. And the only way that they're going to get healed is if guess what? You be the one who goes to them with the healing that you've received from Jesus and take some of that to them. This guy was broken from birth and all he ever was was carried around in his dysfunction. But there's a third thing we see in him. And it says this, he was carried and laid and they laid him daily at the gate of the temple that is called uh, the beautiful gate. Now, here's the thing that really got me every day. These people who were there with him, who carried him, they carried him to this gate to to beg for alms. What that literally meant was he was like the gentleman who sit at the, the freeway intersections that you get to with the sign saying, please, I need food. Every single day he went to this gate and he stood outside this gate and he begged for alms. He begged for offering. He begged for help. Where was he at? He was at the temple, at the gate of the temple, begging for help. You know, it's a hard thing when you see people broken and when they come to the church, they're not coming for a miracle. They're coming for a meal. They're not coming for help. Guess what? They're they're coming just for a handout. Here's the reality is some of us get so comfortable in our brokenness that we stop believing in God to take us out of the situations that we're in. Hallelujah. Somebody needs to realize that you don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to stay who you are. Uh, Christ can do exceedingly and abundantly above 
anything that you can ask or think of. The reality is that you may have been born in iniquity, but guess what? Jesus Christ wants to give a rebirth. You may have been broken when you were born, but guess what? Jesus Christ wants to give you a new life. That's the importance of Jesus coming and giving a new life is that guess what? Jesus can do a do over and he can take the broken things and make them right when you're born in him. But the reality is all this man did was come and beg, come and beg. I'm not coming believing. I'm coming to beg. I'm not coming for a miracle. I'm coming to hopefully get just enough cash to get a McDonald's meal. Guess what? We can do better than a McDonald's meal in Jesus. We can do better to help people than just giving them a little bit because we have the God who has created all things and holds all things together with us when we go somewhere and we can carry him to those people. But that's the reality of some of the brokenness of our people. People are born broken. Just let's think about it. They're born broken. People are around people who don't have a solution and can only carry them further in their dysfunction. And guess what? There are people who have stopped believing in God for the miracle and they only want a little bit to make it. And that is the condition of this man that we see in Acts chapter three, verse two. This man was broken. He was born broken. He was around broken people and he no longer believed in God to heal him from his brokenness. Have you ever been in that place before? Have you ever been in that place where you felt broken and you stopped believing? Because guess what? God is able to do. That is the truth of what it says. God is able to do, but we cannot stop believing. There was a song in the eighties that said, don't stop believing. Guess what? That is the chant for believers right now. Don't stop believing. And guess what? To the world of people who have stopped believing, we got to give them a reason to believe. We got to give them a reason to hope. We got to give them a reason to press. We got to give them a reason to try to crawl towards Jesus, to be like the man where the roof was lifted open and they lowered him in just to get close to Jesus, to be like the woman who had the issue of blood, where she crawled through the clouds just to get a small touch of the hem of his garment for healing. We got to be the ones who take that reality to people and let them know that Jesus can, Jesus is, Jesus is able. Amen. That's the truth. And so we get there and now we get to three. Chapter three, um, verse three, and it says this, uh, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him. I thought that this was a very powerful thing because I want you to think about what the lifestyle of this man would have looked like. Every single day he came and he was laid down at the gates and he would say, alms for the poor, alms for the poor, alms, handouts, help me, help me. And people, because they were going to the temple and they were going for a time of sacrifice and a time of prayer, they would want to show their piety towards the Lord. And they might take a, a coin and flick it towards them just to give him a handout. Kind Kind of like us when we see the guy on the freeway and we drop something out, but we don't even want to roll the window all the way down. We don't want to look at him in the eyes because guess what? Whatever things that are broken in us, we haven't dealt with. And so they just kind of throw something at him and keep it moving. Nobody stops. Nobody just sits there to have a conversation. Nobody is there to really interact with this person and see who they are. They're just kind of flicking change. But guess what? Peter does something different than everybody else. He doesn't just stop and flick change. He stops and gets gazes at the man. He makes eye contact with the man. He sees him where he is. Do you know that broken people just want to be heard? They just want to be known. They just want to be seen. They just want to be loved. Guess what? One of the greatest things that we can do as believers is we get outside the walls of the church is see people where they are. Stop acting so hostility and high like you are just above everybody else because if it wasn't for Jesus, you wouldn't be who you are. You wouldn't be where you are and you wouldn't be what you are. And and we have to remember that at all times. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? That's the reality. And so we see this here. It says, and for Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John. J God thought it necessary to put the details that both of these apostles stopped what they were doing and focused on this person. You know what? Sometimes we got to get outside of ourselves sometime and learn how to look at people and to, to focus on them. But the reality is most of us are too lost on ourselves. We're too lost in our kids sporting games. We're too lost in our own personal finances. We're too lost in our own marriage to care about somebody else. But guess what? You need to get up, get right, get some, get out, go see somebody. That's the truth of what we're seeing in this text. Stop just caring about yourself. Think of others more highly than you think of yourself. That's what they did. 
The simplest thing, such as a gaze and giving attention to somebody who has felt attentionless can be the thing that opens doors for them to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you do that? Can you love somebody by giving them your attention? We are really one of the most unlistening societies. We don't really care about ourselves. We post our pictures daily on our social media platforms. We get in our own stuff. We live in our own comforts. But guess what? God is asking us to do something else. He's asking us to 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 look at people, to focus on people, to see where they are and bring the gospel to where they are. So let's keep going at this text. It says this. And he fixed his attention on them. I thought that this was a beautiful thing because what people sometimes do is they get conceited and believe that everybody should just come to them. Everything should just come to them. But the reality is that the reason this man actually focused his attention on Peter and John was because Peter and John first focused their attention on him. The reason that we love Jesus is not because we're so good, but it's because he first loved us. Can we take the initiative to go after the lost people before we expect them to come to us? You know, the church has gotten into this big mega church field of dreams model. What is that? If you build it, they will come. If you've ever seen the movie Field of Dreams, there's a scene where out of the, 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 the stalks, um, there, there's this voice that says, if you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. The truth is this. That is not what Jesus says. Jesus does not say, if you build it, they will come. Jesus says, go therefore into all the world and make disciples. The reason that this man was at their mercy and at their attention was because guess what? They gave him their attention first. Think about that. They gave him their attention first. What lost people have your attention? I'd really like to know that. What lost people actually have your attention? Think about that. If you can't name any that you've been dialoguing with and giving your time and your attention to, then that means you really haven't been reaching the lost. And I'm gonna be honest, there's one thing that I really is a pet peeve of mine and I really think we as Christians need to get out of this. We need to stop giving ourselves more fruit on the tree than we really have. We need to stop giving ourselves more acclaim and more credit than we really have. Many of us have never discipled anybody. Many of us have never gone to a lost person. Many of us have never been relentless with pursuing somebody for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the truth is this, our lives are not infinite. Our earthly lives are not infinite. These mortal bodies that we have will perish and then we will see God face to face and have to give account for how we used our life. And if all we can say is that we used our life for Monday night football, we used our life for the NBA finals, we used our life to make some cash, we used our life to get some acclaim, God's going to say that everything you did is worthless if you didn't go reach the lost if you didn't go after and give somebody your attention and pursue them. And that's the reality of what we need to learn from them here in this story. And it says this, and Peter directed his gaze at him as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. The reality is this, is that when we go to people, people want something that benefits them. People don't go to things that they don't feel benefit them. And so he looked at them looking for the benefit and look at Peter's response. Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you. See, what Peter said is this, I don't have those things that you are looking for, but I do have something. What I want you to realize is this, is that when we building these relationships with people, we need to stop giving people what they think they want and give them what we know they need, which is the love of Christ. Guess what? People who are broken don't often know how to fix themselves. And guess what? We can testify to that because in our brokenness, we don't know how to fix ourselves all the time. The only person who has the manual and the repair instruction plan is Jesus. But look at this. So he says, I, I, I have no silver or gold, but what I do give to you, I, I, what I do have, I give to you in the name of Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, rise up and walk. I want you to think about this. 
the two things that Peter called the man to was to rise up and to walk. Do you realize that Jesus Christ is calling us to go to people and to give them the strength to rise up and walk by giving them the gospel's power? Jesus Christ wants to see the lame to walk. He wants to see the blind to see. But guess what? When we act as if we're powerless, then the reality is this. We're not giving them that call. It says, rise up and walk. And I want you to see this. And he took him by the right hand. It's amazing to me how often we'll tell people they need to get their act together, but then we're not willing to give them a hand to get up. It's amazing to me how we're willing to criticize and judge people in their brokenness. But when they really need somebody who can create the momentum to help them get up, we're not willing to do it because we don't want to get our hands dirty. That's the truth for many of us. Many of us are coward Christians. We don't want to get our hands dirty. We're not willing to touch somebody that's in a dirtier place than we are. But the reality is this, is that Jesus was never too good to love on people, to touch people. Jesus got down in the dirt space in the dirt, made cakes and put them into the eyes of people so that the blind could see. There was nothing and no one too dirty that Jesus would not come to them. Guess what? Everybody needs a hand sometimes. You would not be where you are if someone didn't give you a hand sometime. You would not be where you are if someone had not only just shared the gospel message with you, but then gave you some physical interaction, some physical help to help you walk that thing out. Guess what? You can't walk as a Christian by yourself. And the scripture speaks to it because it talks about that. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. We're in that that relationship with somebody where we're with somebody who's going to push us along and motivate us along. The reality is this. Everybody needs a hand sometime. And the real question becomes, are you the person who's willing to give them a hand or are you the person who's willing to bark what somebody should do, but only sit on the sidelines and look? because that is not what God calls Christians to be. That is not who Jesus died to make Christians be. He asked us to be people who get down in the trenches with people, love on people, share the gospel with people, and then give them a hand to get up. That is what God is calling us to do. And watch the response of the man, because it says this, and he took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. This is where the miracle happened. When he gave him the hand, somewhere in the process of giving him the hand and pulling him up, God did the miracle. We know this, this to be true. God is able. God could have healed the man while he was still lying on the ground. God could have healed the man from the moment of his birth. God could have healed the man. But guess what? Here's the reality. Here is the reality. God sometimes won't do the healing in someone else until he uses people to do it through. God does healing through people. Can he do it himself? Yes. But he knows that he will get a greater glory when he does it through you. So let's keep going right here. Took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong and leaping up. He stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. This right here is it. The man was on the ground begging, but by the time it was done, he was leaping and praising. We got to stop trying to get people to praise. We got to start giving them a hand up because somewhere in the process, God does the miracle. God gives the revelation. God does the work so that the people who came and they were only looking for a handout now come looking to be holy. The people who only came because they were wanting something now came with worship. The man who only wanted alms, who was no longer looking for a miracle, but was looking for a meal now had a praise on his lips because God had done a work in his life through the people of God. Guess what? Maybe if we get in the trenches with people, God will do the miracle. God will do the work and the people will worship and the people will praise. Guess what? I'm preaching to myself right now because I know there are times when I'm tired. There are times when I don't want to, but if we keep doing the work of God and trust him to do the miracle in somebody's life, then we may see somebody set free in worship because that's what God came to do. How do we know that? Because I want you to just look at a couple verses about who Jesus says that he, that he is and what he came to do. Isaiah 53 verse five says this, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. Guess what? Jesus came to heal. Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to 
to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He came to heal and he came to set free. Guess what? John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. John 12, 46, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. God wants to take the broken, the hurting, and he wants to do all kind of amazing things in their life to set them free, to heal them, to build them up, to stand them up, to let them leap and to let them worship. But it starts through you. It starts through you. I love the final two verses. It says in nine and 10, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Look at this. They didn't just see him walking, but they saw him walking with a praise attached to it. There's something powerful that happens when a person who you saw broken before now is walking healed and they got a praise on their lips. That's a testimony to the qualitativeness of God, the efficacy and power of God, the person and agenda of God, the gospel of God. When people see people walking in that, it amazes them and it makes them know that there is power in the blood. There is power in the name. There is power at the cross. There is power in Jesus. Look what it says. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. They were filled with wonder and amazement. Guess what? When people are filled with wonder and amazement, they want to know more. And maybe sometimes if we get in the trenches and help one, and reach one and teach one, God will create a testimony through their life that will cause many more people to want to know more about Jesus. The church needs its power back. The church needs its power turned back on. The question is, if you have the ability to do it through your testimony, through your evangelism, through your heart going to the lost, would you do it? Let's pray. Father God, we just come before you right now. We ask that you would help us to be a church without walls. Help us to be a church that's not lost in a building, that's not defined by a building, um, but that, that are people who go out into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. God, would you do a work in our hearts and a work in our mind to prepare us to have this transition in our life and to actually live out what Jesus wants us to do? God, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit. God, just make us uh, new in you so that we have the fervor and the passion, the dedication and the drive to go to the lost and to tell them about you. So God, would you have your way? I pray that even through a TV screen, you will be convicting hearts and uh, transforming hearts and uh, igniting a fire in people. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed that video. If you would like to see more, please visit our website at lifepointcc.org, where we are believing in God to have a life-changing message waiting for you.